Good evening and welcome to a special edition of the India and the World webinar at Carnegie India. Joining me today is David Loin, a foremost expert on Afghanistan. David took a ride with Taliban forces in 1996 when they first entered Kabul and created the first Islamic Emirate. He's reported on Afghanistan for over three decades for the BBC. He worked as a strategic communications advisor in the office of President Ghani, who is now, of course, living outside of Afghanistan. David is the author of The Butcher and Bolt, an incredible study of 200 years of foreign engagement in Afghanistan, and Frontline, a book that recounts reporting from the world's deadliest places. He's just completed a book titled The Long War, the inside story of America in Afghanistan since 9-11. It could not be more aptly timed. David, where do I start? You've, you've been an insider to the Afghan government. You have tracked Afghanistan more deeply than almost anyone I know. We're in a strange situation at the moment. Mullah Baradar arrived with his aides to Kandahar yesterday. Um, Anas Haqqani, who until about two and a half years ago was a prisoner of the government of Afghanistan, met this morning with uh, President Harmeet Karzai, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, Kulbuddin Hikmatyar, and others. What's happening right now, David? Well, it's, it's a fascinating question, and it's a, what a day to, 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 to answer that question. And thank you very much to you, Rudy, and to Carnegie for this opportunity to speak with such a distinguished audience. I think you mentioned those two meetings today. It was quite interesting that um, Anas Akhani met Gulbuddin Hekmatia, the former uh, leader of the Hezbi Islami uh, Party, a former uh, guerrilla fighter who came in from the cold in a negotiated settlement with the government in 2016, having been an ally of the Taliban. He met him separately from uh, the former president, Hamid Karzai, and Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, until now the head of the peace process. So th those three men were said to be forming some sort of an interim government, some sense of a coordination council that could hand over power properly to the Taliban, but they weren't the government. Um, the government, in a sense, collapsed overnight when Ashraf Ghani fled the country on Saturday and uh, precipitated in, in some ways the, the final fall of Kabul. So I think those negotiations, those discussions that have been going on today and the are the beginnings of the Taliban trying to say to the international community that they're not just going to take power by force, they are going to try and have an, some sort of an inclusive administration. But what that administration will look like, we just don't know. They say that they've changed. They say that they've learned from you know, the lessons of, of, of when they were in power. They're conducting an extremely sophisticated um, uh, media and communications campaign in five languages in the two Afghan languages, Urdu, particularly for Pakistan, Arabic for the Gulf, and of course, English. They're increasingly tweeting and putting social media posts out in English. And all of their English social media is very much a reassuring presence for the West. Um, but just to go back through some of their own social media internally, one example, um, a real live argument that was going on between Taliban in the field and Taliban in Doha over the last month, was whether to kill um, Afghan soldiers who surrendered to them. And those in the field said they wanted to kill them and those in Doha said they shouldn't. And that, that argument went, was carried on in social media in, in Dari and Pashtun. So I think within Afghanistan, you know, the sense of this being you know, a, a moral, moderate uh, Islamic government that's going to be sort of conciliatory and inclusive um, is very much open to question. The, uh, the, the spokesman who up until now has been um, a, a shadowy figure, uh, we believe there have been many Zabiullah Mujahids over the years. The, the one who appeared yesterday was certainly not the same one that I met when I interviewed Zabiullah Mujahid in 2007 um, for the BBC and behind enemy lines in, on a trip in, in Afghanistan then. Um, but he gave a very conciliatory press conference. But again, intriguingly, the... Uh, you know, the symbols of that press conference were rather important. Um, he was very keen to ask to answer questions from Western media, um, international media. He wasn't so keen to, he, he cut off some of the Afghan media who asked questions and, and tried to get another international journalist to ask a question. So there was some sense that the, the messaging from that, that media conference was to the international community 
And of course, poignantly for many Afghan journalists who were there, the last time they were in that room was uh, just a little over a week ago when the, when the, the head of the Media Information Center, Minapal, Dawa Minapal, was sitting in the same chair that uh, Zabiullah Mujahid was sitting. And of course, Minapal was shot on that Friday, the week before the fall of Kabul, um, coming out of Friday prayers. You know, how much more an Islamic thing was he doing than, than going to Friday prayers? So um, there were a lot of the journalists in the room, you know, remembered that rather poignant difference between, you know, what had happened um, with this brutal savagery against the person who'd run the government media information centre and the people who were now sitting in those seats. No, David, these are, I mean, almost every single sentence, um, you know, has a kind of a chilling effect in terms of, I mean, there are ironies, there are paradoxes, and then there's the reality of what's happening at the moment. Before I take a step back and perhaps we spend some time on how how we actually got here. Just one more question on the Taliban. So someone like Azabiel Mujahid now clearly doesn't have a curtain to hide behind. They're out in the open, they're in the front. The Taliban's on the streets, they need to govern. But just a quick question on Taliban consolidation. Uh, symbolically, of course, it's extremely important that Mullah Barada travels out to Kandahar, his home. Um, I can only assume that he's going to meet military commanders, people from various shuras, political offices, some who he's not possibly met in a very long time. How consolidated do you think the Taliban is likely to be, or is it just too early to, uh, to take a stab at that question? Well, it's, it's a movement and not a political party. That's perhaps the right sort of language to use about it. So, and it does, that movement does bring together, you know, many different groups, you know, some of whom have fought in the past. Um, there was very significant fighting between different groups um, when uh, it was revealed that Mullah Omar had died um, two years previously to 2015, when they finally announced that he died. Um, so, you know, th th there are, and that's as recently as 2015. By the way, there are now rumours that um, uh, Habib, Habib, Habib Tullah Akin, Akin Sada, the leader of the Taliban, um, may have died. So once again, the Taliban may be, do, may be concealing the death of a leader uh, because he hasn't been seen for some time. Mullah Barada, you mentioned going to Kandahar symbolically for his first visit back to Afghanistan, is expected to be the leader of whatever it emerges as, a, as an administration, a government um, from the Taliban, and how inclusive that is, is of course a question. Um, and they're talking, they talked a little bit in the press conference yesterday, and there's been some other briefings, they're talking about an inclusive government, but not elections. So how are they going to build accountability into that? Um, is very is very difficult to, to, to say. And I think, you know, all of us who've been watching this closely have got it wrong all the way along the line. So I hesitate to predict what it's going to look like um, in, in terms of, of, of that administration. But they've been talking about an Islamic emirate. And in the conversations that, that negotiators from the now former government held in Doha with the Taliban, over the last um, year or so, 15 months, when they have managed to sit down in a room and say, well, what is it that you mean by an Islamic Emirate? It's very difficult to get to the bottom of that. So there aren't, there aren't good answers to that, even when relations are quite good and there were some discussions. So, you know, we don't know what it'll look like. And they're certainly not, they certainly don't have the sophisticated capacity to run a modern state. They're a very centralized movement. They have, you know, from the military committee and the political committee, They've had shadow governors, now governors of Afghan provinces, shadow police chiefs, a shadow system that's very much centrally appointed from the top with not much accountability, not much sort of consensus building, any of the other things that politicians do. Because at the end of the day, this is a movement that governs and will govern by force, by the gun. It was, um, again, a, a symbolic, poignant picture the um, uh, was the, the, the Taliban sitting at the, the desk in the presidential palace that, you know, I remember when I was working with President Ghani, you know, I would sit, sit and hold meetings with him at that desk. And he, when he came in in 2014, um, had that desk restored. It was made originally for King Amanullah in the 1920s. And he had it restored and put it into his office because he saw his administration as being continuing the reformist um, ambitions of the Amanullah regime in the 19, the Amanullah government in the 1920s. And of course, Amanullah, in the same way as Ghani, fled, fell, fell and fled to a 
rural, you know, Islamist um, uh, rebellion that, that brought him down. So it, there is a sort of a terrible echo. And the Taliban sitting at that desk had a Kalashnikov where Ashraf Ghani would have had a book. So you do have, in a sense, very symbolically, but I think actually the constitution and the rule of law and however flawed it was with uh, President Ghani, and I think history won't judge him kindly for the way he fled the office at the end, um, but he did many, many good things while he was in, in office. And, and I, I think looking at the Taliban in contrast to that, you know, they do govern by force. And whatever's happening in Kabul, they're playing very nice with Western correspondents, including Western women correspondents. Women television presenters are still on the air interviewing Taliban spokespeople who go into studios and Tolo TV, et cetera. Behind all that, in the countryside, there are terrible things happening. Uh, you know, it, these accounts of Taliban fighters taking young women out of their houses and, and effectively making them sex slaves, raping them, really, they call them wives. Um, they're true. I mean, there's, they're, they've been attested by a number of different sources. So in the same way, they've been going house to house in Kabul with lists um, very comprehensive list of people who work for the government, people who work for the international community, and taking them out, and we don't know what's happening to them. In Kandahar, there are bodies in the street of, of former soldiers and former government officials who, who've been murdered by the, by the Taliban. So I think we've seen in, in actions um, some pretty awful things behind those you know, very, very emollient words that are coming from the administration in Kabul. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, um, I mean, I think some of the reporting on this has been very kind of um, been illustrative, but, um, but so David, just to, I mean, if I just stick with the Taliban for a second before I want to take a step back and kind of ask the larger question of how we got here. Um, the Taliban clearly has a tight information campaign. They've tried very hard in the first couple of days. Clearly, they've had to cobble this together. Um, it was very clear in Barada's own interview that you know he didn't expect the victories to take place as fast as they did. Um, I hear now that there are many sort of both fighters as political officers making their way to Kabul to consolidate. They're kind of thinking of the security situation in Kandahar. Um, but beyond the, beyond the whitewash, beyond the information campaign, as you say, the reality on the ground is very different. I mean, even symbolically, this whole point of if the Taliban really thought about it, they'd enter the presidential palace with Barader uh, through a legitimate swearing-in ceremony rather than have it have these pictures on Al Jazeera with fighters going room to room and looking at clocks and gold plates and so on and so forth. Um, so I just want to stay with this for two minutes. Uh, is What faith do you have in what the political officers say um, and how long do you think that we're going to be able to see some degree of stability before things really start to fall apart? Well, I mean, I think in, a, in some ways, Rudy, we're already seeing things falling apart. Right. Um, uh, the, the, um, there's been some very interesting um, demonstrations uh, this morning in, in Asadabad in Kunar, in Jalalabad, in Nangahar, of crowds of people carrying the Afghan flag, um, the, the Afghan flag that the Taliban have now replaced with the, their white banner with Islamic writing. And I think um, uh, th those are, you know, they're very brave, those demonstrations, but they show that the Taliban do not govern with consent. And I think one of the interesting things between the time they came in in 1996 and now, that's the, one of the really the key differences. Um, believe it or not, they were in some ways welcomed in some parts of Afghanistan when they came in in the mid 1990s. And you know, I could see why. I'd spent a lot of time with them between 1995 and 1996. And as you mentioned, I went into Kabul with their, with their front line when they took the city in, in September 1996, nearly 25 years ago to the month. And in Kabul, and actually certainly in the south, there was a sense that the awful banditry and corruption of the civil war, the Mujahideen who turned against each other and destroyed the city in a way that the Russian war never did, um, that the Taliban were bringing some relief from that. And of course, the other aspect, the other difference between the mid-1990s and now is that they entered a country that was broken and ruined and poor and you know, absolutely had no sense of, uh, of development. 
Well, now in the last 20 years, that's different. There have been huge numbers of mistakes. A lot of money was squandered. Too many people died. But out of all that, um, a new sort of society developed, you know, a new generation who owe their entire lives to American-funded education, American-funded universities, healthcare. It wasn't perfect, but it wasn't, it was much better than it had been before. So I think the Taliban come into a, a country which they do not govern with consent. Um, and th there's no sense of welcome. There's a sense of uh, over overwhelming fear um, right across Afghanistan, except I suppose potentially in some southern locations. But even there, there's been some striking reporting in recent months from different CSOs, NGOs and, and, and think tanks looking at women's rights in the countryside in Afghanistan. And women there expect something different now. Women's rights are not just a sort of Western obsession, which they were in 2001. They're now an expectation for a new generation of Afghan women. And I think uh, that's gonna, it's going to be much more difficult for the Taliban in the towns and in the countryside with, uh, if, they, if social media remains, with people being able to communicate with social media. Yeah, and we'll come back to some of the questions about societal expectations and governance. But if I just take a step back, David, how did we end up here? It was 10 days ago, General Nick Carter wrote a piece in the Times where he said, look, give the Afghan National Army a chance. Let's not write them off. The US intelligence officials are clearly feeding the media in the United States. They've made it very clear is that, look, the Biden administration, the National Security Council, they had the facts. They knew for a fact that things are going to crumble. This house of cards is going to fall really fast. The army is not going to fight. There are going to be a whole bunch of messy and patchy deals from different parts of Afghanistan. The minute you withdraw in full force, don't expect stability. So was this just a colossal policy failure? Yeah, I don't. I mean, th th those intelligence reports after the fact, are, you know, have to be taken with a bit of a pinch of salt. I mean, I talked to very senior British military figures. You mentioned the, the Nick Carter piece, but around the same time, um, just over a week ago, who were saying, you know, who were agreeing with me, or 10 days ago, that um, the Afghan army, although the, the, the regular army of, and police, paramilitary police, are, are said to be on paper some 300,000, although that might not fight as well as, as, as uh, one, one would, would hope and expect an army to defend its country, there are some, some 30,000 plus special forces and a functioning air force, although it relied on American contractors, so it had less capacity once they, once they left. There were fewer airframes that were, were airworthy um, in, in, in recent days. But that those special forces would fight and they'd hold the cities. And even if the countryside folded, and actually there was an expectation, there was a, a demand, a desire by the Americans and their other allies to withdraw from those 3,000 or so checkpoints across the country that the Afghan army and police insisted on, on remaining on, um, and to withdraw to the cities and to, to withdraw to what was defendable. Um, and in a sense, it all just happened much more quickly than than really than I think anyone expected, despite those, you know, post facto, we all knew it was going to happen from, from intelligence people now. I mean, you can track once things have happened, how it happened. But, you know, if you'd asked those people honestly last week, whether they thought it was going to happen as quickly as, as it has, you know, I think they'd have been lying. I, I mean, there was one very interesting account, though, uh, uh, yesterday on, on the BBC, um, that when... Bismillah Khan Mohammadi was appointed the, the uh, um, defense minister about six weeks ago. And this came from a source close to Mohammadi. Um, he was told that the Afghan army wasn't, wasn't 300,000 troops. It was actually in reality only 50,000 troops. And, you know, those of, you know, of questionable quality. So perhaps half of them special forces. So I think you know, we've seen the collapse of something that was already really hollow. Um, you know, we, we know about the problems of so-called ghost soldiers, units that weren't really there because the pay was taken by their senior officers. Um, there have been a lot of accounts of, of fuel, um, um, food, even ammunition sold to the Taliban uh, uh, rather than going to the front lines. So this was an army that felt that its officers didn't, uh, uh, you know, didn't really regard it. So they weren't, so morale began to collapse quite quickly. And I think once it collapsed, it uh, collapsed right across the whole 
of the Afghan armed forces. And we've seen in, in history when this happens uh, previously. It's a bit, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's not really a fair, a fair um, analogy, but, but let me give it to you now. I've started on it. Um, it's a little bit like a, you know, a test match where a cricket, a cricket side, you know, once the wickets start to fall, they all fall. And because people begin to lose the will to, to go out and bat. And I think the Afghan army just lost, lost the will actually to defend the country. And President Ghani, despite the efforts of, of many people, in, including me, uh, to try and improve communications from the top in the Afghan government, um, remained um, a remote figure, an aloof figure um, to the Afghan population. He, he wasn't, he, I mean, he was respected, but he wasn't loved, uh, I think, you know, widely. He wasn't someone who would go down and talk to soldiers and sort of rally them and appear on social media, you know, talking to individuals like that. It, that wasn't his, his temperament. It wasn't his style as a leader. He had other qualities. So I think, you know, the Afghan army sort of hollowed, was, was completely hollowed out. And the other fascinating thing that happened last week, apart from senior officers being paid off by the Taliban in the old fashioned way, you know, power changes hands in Afghanistan, not through battles, but through, you know, agreements on the ground. There was a very interesting and potentially successful um, Taliban deception campaign. There have been a number of accounts by um, Afghan soldiers that they were told that if they surrendered, then there would be an interim government and a peaceful uh, transition government um, that the Taliban wouldn't necessarily immediately take over. So they surrendered on that basis. And you know, that was, there were some, there some social media reports last week talking about an interim government and a transition government. And I think the Taliban successfully manipulated that um, to the point that these people now feel betrayed. And it's going to be very interesting to see since they feel betrayed, they feel that they weren't able to fight for their country. They've been insulted by President Biden yesterday in his speech saying, you know, if the Afghan army won't fight, why should we fight for them? Um, something that I think uh, many people in Afghanistan, you know, felt was, was, was not really reasonable given the, the 50, 60,000 casualties that their armed forces have taken um, in, in recent years. So, you know, I think, um, it, it, the other one, one of sorry, just finally, one other big question on the Afghan army is whether it was configured too much in a Western way. And there's some lessons learned going on in the West now as to if we do this again, should we build an army in that way? Are there other ways of building an army? And I think I'm not sure I know the answer to that question because there aren't that many ways of, of building a sophisticated armed force. But there's a sense in which perhaps the West went in and tried to impose its its military you know, way of doing things as well as its, its, its way of, of, of building governments. A quick question, a slight unfair one on, on President Ghani. You know him professionally, you've worked with him, you've reported on him, you also know him personally. What happens to him now? Well, I think he's, a, he's finished, um, you know, in, in terms of the country of his birth. I think he's, you know, he's He's despised. There's a lot of um, a lot of people who work very closely with him have, have come out very strongly in saying, you know, he betrayed them. Um, and, you know, including, for example, very strongly, there's been some very strong comments by the former head of the Afghan Central Bank, uh, Ajmal Ahmadi, in the last couple of days, talking about how, you know, they were expecting the president to at least have a sort of two week handover period. Um, so, I, you know, let's see what, 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 where he emerges. Um, you know, he and two, his two closest political allies fled together um, with this rather curious Russian account that they took, um, you know, suitcases full of cash. And I mean, I don't know whether that's true, uh, but there's only, that's the only source for it. So, you know, I think, he's, I think it's going to be very difficult for him to do anything other than uh, to apologise at some point for, for, the, for the way that he left. And we're going to, on, on apologies and on responsibility and accountability, we're going to come back to the Biden administration and the UK and Europe in a bit. But I just want to turn my attention on what could loosely be called the opposition. Um, David, it looks like there are sort of two centers of opposition, very different in character, that seem to be growing. One is up in the old Panshi, for instance, Amrullah Saleh, the vice president, who is now clearly... Um, assume the position of the president, which he says is constitutionally mandated. 
Um, he's kind of tweeted about it. He's been quite public about it. He's there with the young Masood, the old Ahmed Shah Masood's son. They're holed up in the Panjshir and they seem to be, at least at the moment, the rhetoric seems to be around fighting. The second opposition, and I hesitate to say opposition, but certainly the opposite side of the Taliban is based very much in Kabul, around Dr. Abdul Abdullah, the transitional council that you just talked about with Hikmatyar and with Karzai, for instance. How do you see this panning out in the near future? What is the role of the transitional council, number one? Do they play a political role in the near future? Number two, do you see Saleh and that group of people actually taking to arms? Well, on the political figures first, um, I mean, I think they uh, frankly play less of a role than they than they want to play. They, they, they want to see themselves as in some way handing over power as being, you know, responsible guardians of the constitution. But I mean, it's it's that they're effectively, um, you know, under house arrest. Uh, uh, it, it, that's what it what it looks like. They they're not able to to operate freely. Um, they've got they've, they've all got as 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 other organisations in Afghanistan. They've all got their own private security people. And in fact, the Taliban have been quite honourable about about leaving weapons on, you know, in in private security hands um, when they've you know when they've gone around the city. So. You know the Taliban are treating them at the moment well, um, and you know, and let, let's see how you know Mullah Barada, who's you know the key player in all this. I mean, these negotiations that are going on with uh, Anas Haqqani at the moment are really for show. I mean, I think there's very much substantial negotiation that, that that's happening because these people haven't got power to hand over. You know, the, the power has changed hands. Uh, you know, very. Swiftly and, and and very and and actually much more quickly than the Taliban expected. Um, you know, I heard yesterday that there's some ten thousand Taliban on their way to Kabul now um, because it was it was such a quick handover. There was only a very small number of Taliban who thought that we knew it was happening, and suddenly there were you know Taliban on motorbikes in the streets of Kabul. So, you know, I think it's they're feeling their way around you know what they're what they're planning to do with this country, having taken it. Um, and I think there's going to be very interesting questions about the connections between Abdullah in particular of that, of that group and the group who are now up in, in Panjshir Valley. And for people who've not been in Afghanistan, Panjshir has a sort of mythical hold on the national imagination because it was the one place in Afghanistan that didn't fall to the Russians, despite famously seven attempts by the Russians to take it in the 1980s. And it held out against the Taliban after 1996, um, of course, in the hands of Ahmed Shah Massoud, the legendary guerrilla fighter who, who, who's from the Panjshir and is, you know, Af perhaps Afghanistan's you know, most revered martyr, Massoud Roundabout in Kabul, is, you know, is now a national shrine. And I think we're going to see it's, it's his, his son, as you mentioned, and Amrullah Saleh, who formed the key nexus of um, what will be armed opposition to um, to the Taliban? Uh, you know, I was um, I saw a report of a community meeting in Panjshir about ten days ago before the Taliban had moved on this such a swift move across the country. And in, 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 even then, the Panjshiris were saying, "We won't let this happen. You know, we're going to take up weapons. We'll fight against the the Taliban administration." Um, already, some foreign embassies have taken down Ghani's picture and put Amrullah Saleh's picture there. Um, symbolically to say that this now is the president. They accept that he, he is the president. He's tweeting as the office of the president and standing for continuity of the, of the Afghan constitution. He's a, he's a, a maverick figure. Um, you know, he formed his own political party about 10 years ago um, in opposition to the old Mujahideen, who were his, his allies. Um, and he has very, very strong Western connections, intriguingly. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see what the United States does with Amrullah Saleh. He was a CIA asset um, back in the 1990s. Um, and, uh, you know, after 9-11, after you know, he played a significant role in supporting the Americans in, in coming in. Some of his family are in the United States. Um, so I think he, he's, a, he's going to be rather an intriguing figure. He's certainly the now emerged as the leader of, of the effective opposition to the, to the Taliban. And I think, you know, we'll see, there's been reports of, of special forces units that didn't want to surrender 
you know, moving around the country, um, uh, you know, heavily armed, and they'll clearly be moving towards Panchia, um, which is only a couple of hours drive, two and a half hours drive north of Kabul. Um, and one of the reasons that it um, has its, this extraordinary place in, in recent Afghan history is actually its, its physical uh, sense. If you, if you drive up um, north of, of, of uh, Jabal Siraj, north to the north of, northeast of Kabul, you get to the beginning of the Panchir Valley and there's a very, very narrow entrance to the valley with the, with the Panchir River going up it and a narrow choke between the mountains with these high mountain walls on, on either side. It's a, it's a natural fortress. You can just, just put a tank in the middle of the road and, and stop a, an advancing army. Um, so, you know, it, the, the, uh, Amr al-Asali and, and the, the Panchiris can potentially hold it against the Taliban. It's going to be a very interesting question to see whether they'll move out in a military offensive or whether the Taliban will, will take on what's really a significant irritant to them um, in terms of having not having the whole of Afghanistan, which will be a significant question, as it was in the 1990s, over international recognition. Because if they don't hold the whole landmass of Afghanistan, then they're, one of the arguments that they will have for international recognition is significantly reduced. And I can imagine that for exactly those reasons and for the need of continuation and governance, you want the banks to work, you want the dams to work, you want the roads to function. At some level, you want some taxes to be collected. Um, and then you've got this question of recognition. The Taliban are going to have to work at some level with former officials. So I just want to come back to the question of the transitional council. Um, you know, as you say, it seems highly unlikely that there's going to be any kind of power sharing agreement. There's no necessity for that. There's no rationale for that. Um, would you say that the future of the Transitional Council is potentially outside of Afghanistan, playing something of a constructive role for the sake of the country to keep continuation going? Um, making it also, I, I can only imagine, a bit difficult for them, given the opposition that their own brethren are putting up, up in the Panjshir. I think that's, I mean, uh, let, let's see, Rudy. I mean, I think it's a really interesting question and, and I'm not sure that any, any of us have the answers. I mean, you mentioned, you know, the rest of the administration, they have asked former government civil servants to come to work. Um, they, I mentioned Ajmal Abadi, uh, Amadi, the, the head of the former, of the, uh, of the Afghan National Bank, the central bank. He um, has revealed that basically there isn't any money. He believes that about 0.1% of Afghan national reserves are available to the Taliban because, of course, they're, you know, they're held in treasury bills abroad and, and the United States will freeze those assets. So there isn't any money. Um, they have got quite an, a sophisticated state potentially to run if that's what they want to do, if they want to run the, you know, the schools and, 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 and clinics. And in the areas that they've taken in the past, they have run schools and, and health facilities and you know, wanted to build roads, etc. So it, it looks as if they, you know, they do want to run, you know, a modern administration. They don't just want um, rural, you know, values in the way that they did in the 1990s when they, they didn't really seem to want to run this as a sophisticated country, but it is now a sophisticated country and they will want a functioning taxation system as well as customs revenues, which of course they'll have. They'll want trade to operate. They'll take their, their checkpoints off. Uh, but of course, there are big questions as to whether they are keen to be legitimate traders. You know, they've turned into a criminal, a criminal gang in recent years in a way that they weren't in the 1990s. Again, a, another big change from the 1990s. Um, in the, in, 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 for just a couple of years before 9-11, they stopped poppy growing altogether. They didn't want to grow poppies. Well, now, of course, they're extremely financed by it. They're, they're financed by... Um, access and control by extortion from taxes on timber, um, coal, gems, and believe it or not, talc, which is a, a major export um, industry for Afghanistan. So, you know, do they want to turn those extortions into proper taxes and use them for a functioning state, or do they want to remain the, the sort of criminal mafia that they have become in recent years? And I think there'll be big challenges within the Taliban movement you know, from the, some of the criminal elements to hold on to those, uh, those assets and hold on to those revenue streams. David, you mentioned the part about the United States cutting off uh, financial ties to Afghanistan at, the, at this particular point in time and modern economics works where they're going to be, have to be dependent on international markets to finance the state. But the Taliban are also in Afghanistan at a very different time. I mean, 
the top 20, 25 Taliban leaders, many of whom you have met and spent time working on, um, have traveled the world. They have visas stamped in a passport, which I do believe is the passport of the 1990s. You know, symbolically, they refuse to give up that passport, many of them. They've been in hotels. They've had the best of care in Doha, in Berlin, in London, in Oslo. And let's face it, we've we've all spent time and we've been behind in those closed door meetings since about 2010, 2011. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that Taliban also has options today. So China, Russia, Iran, they have embassies, which I believe are open. The Russian ambassador tweeted out saying he's in the safest place in the world. I believe the Iranian consulates are open. Iranian officials are moving around Afghanistan um, like it's normal. They've not been stopped. So clearly there's some understanding there. How do you see that landscape emerging and evolving? I think there's one you know, very big element in that, uh, Rudy, which is the is the the withdrawal, the retreat, really, from you know international power that this means for America. This is a very big setback for the United States um, and for uh, America's Western allies. And there's a lot of disquiet in Europe about the way that this ha this has happened and the way that Europe, in particular the United Kingdom, the most powerful military force in Europe, uh, allowed it to happen. So I think. You know, we've got some pretty searching questions to ask about uh, the way that the West manages its its affairs, actually, in the international community, because this does feel like a significant retreat for, for Western power and significant advance and advantage for those countries you mentioned, for China, uh, Russia, um, Iran. You know, none of those countries are, are, are quickly leaping to recognise the Taliban administration, because, of course, it doesn't yet really exist. But... You know, in coming days, uh, you know, as you say, the, the mood music coming out from those embassies is very strong. There's been a lot of speculation that China has cut some kind of a deal with the Taliban for, you know, access routes for the Silk Route across uh, the north of, of Afghanistan in return for the Taliban insisting that um, the East Turkestan Islamic movement, um, the, the Uyghur separatist group, is not able to operate on, on, Af on um, Afghan soil. Now, we know that ETIM does operate on Afghan soil, so it's going to be interesting to see if the Taliban are able to carry out that promise. But in terms of their relationships, this you know, significantly changes the, the geopolitics, actually, of South and Central Asia. And of course, you know, I mean, we, we've kept off India up to now, but it's a big setback for India, too. Um, huge investment in Afghanistan over the years. I was there when the Afghan parliament was being built, you know, watching you know, Sikh foremen working with Afghan, uh, Afghan builders to, to build the parliament, the Salma Dam contract, um, very close relations with, with Narendra Modi and, of course, the Chabahar Dam and, and railways and, 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 and movement across to, uh, to India through Iran. And all of that is now really in jeopardy, although, as you mentioned, the Iranian relationship could be key um, for India in terms of if it does want to re-establishing some kind of foothold in Afghanistan, despite the enormous advance that Pakistan has made on this. So I'm going to stay with this uh, line and I should just apologize to the viewers. I'm not going to take your names of the many questions that have come to me on very different platforms. But if you don't mind, I'm going to take the themes of your questions and just keep it the flow. So as you can imagine, David, is there are lots of questions on India and Pakistan. And as someone who's sort of, you know, seen this kind of puzzle play out in, has Pakistan won in Afghanistan? Yeah, I mean, again, and I should say to your audience, I hesitate uh, as, a, you know, a British um, uh, observer of your region and lover of all the countries in it um, to, to to get involved in this in a, in a very big way. But yes, is the, is the clear answer. Um, uh, and to give evidence on that, um, you know, there's been a lot of accounts of, you know, Punjabi voices among the Taliban in Herat, in Kabul, in, in, in the north. Um, a lot of accounts of... Um, of Urdu Punjabi being spoken, of course, not otherwise spoken in, in, Afghan, in Afghanistan. And I have to say also of other languages that people don't recognize what they are. So presumably Chechens and other, you know, irregular Islamic fighters who come into the country. But no, this is a, a as well as the Afghan Taliban who are trained and educated in Pakistani madrasas, the Afghan Taliban who have been uh, given support in Pakistani hospitals, all of the military material that's now gone across the frontier into Pakistan and is being presumably being restored and in order to, to return to Afghanistan. 
As well as that, you have you know regular Pakistani support. There's been more than one account of, of, of people identifying you know people who were Pakistani soldiers themselves in the field. So I think you know Pakistan is is is, is riding a very very difficult and dangerous tiger, given their own challenging problems that they have with the with the PTM, the the, the Pashtun um, awakening movement in uh, Pakistan, and given their own problems with with the Pakistani Taliban, the TTP. So, you know, it's going to be a really, really interesting challenge for Pakistan as to whether they can, you know, they can, having lit this fire of, of, uh, of Islamic fundamentalism in their neighboring country, they finally got what they want. Um, and it might not be, you know, what they what they expected. Um, you know, we've seen, you know, uh, the Prime uh, Imran Khan coming out and saying uh, Afghanistan has thrown off the shackles of, of, of uh, 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 and, uh, and is now free. Mm-hmm. And you know, this very strong sense that America has been you know, defeated. Pakistan is very strongly, particularly the Imran Khan government, strongly anti-American um, uh, vein running through it. Um, and so, yes, I mean, it, it, it doesn't look good. And of course, um, the, the old Pakistani doctrine of strategic depth, which, you know, many of us thought that they'd moved away from, you know, has now come roaring back and, and Pakistan will want to continue to have the influence that it does in, in Afghanistan um, with significant uh, influence, if not control, over whatever administration emerges. Just staying with that, David, so in India, at least behind closed doors, there's a very strong sense that it was the British officials um, who struck some sort of accord with Pakistani officials, the close working relationship with General Bajwa, with the view for Pakistan to provide certain assurances, guarantees, get the Taliban on the table, make sure that they're kept on the table and and, and possibly have some leverage over the Taliban down the line. Um, what Indian officials, as you can well imagine, are concerned about more than perhaps anything else is the fact that Afghan soil, as you say, is already being populated by those who are outside of the Taliban, who are not Pashtuns, who are not Afghan. It's the Lashkar Taiba, it's the Jesh Mohammed. There's a UN report of June 2021 which suggests that remnants of Al-Qaeda are still very much in and around the Durand line, a line that you know better than any. But these are assurances that were supposed to have been squared away by the February 2020 deal under the Trump administration. Um, so w- when it comes to the United States and comes to Britain and America's position in Afghanistan, do they provide any assurances when it comes to counterterrorism, when it comes to the fact of how will they hold the Taliban accountable? Well, they have no influence now. Um, that's, that's, you know, that's the big challenge. There's no sense that um, you know, they can't even get you know, British citizens with passports can't even get to the airport where there are British soldiers who want to put them on airplanes as of today. That's how little influence uh, the United Kingdom and the United States have got. They can't even rely on, they can't even guarantee security for their own citizens in, in Afghanistan, let alone you know, preventing um, Afghanistan once again becoming um, a, a, a cradle of you know, international jihadism. I mean, I think all that one can hope for is that the Taliban won't want that to happen because um, you know what, what happened after Mullah Omar was very wary of, of uh, Osama bin Laden in the late 1990s. You know, after the attacks on Kenya and uh, and, uh, and Tanzania in 1998 on the on, on the American embassies by Al Qaeda carried out from Afghanistan, and there were cruise missiles lobbed into training camps in Afghanistan. You know, Mullah Omar tried to sort of keep um, Osama bin Laden under a much closer reign that of course failed, um, as we know with the consequences on 9-11 in 2001. So, you know, I think the Taliban now will not want, you know, international jihadism, you know, from their soil for their own selfish reasons in order to keep their administration intact, but not because, you know, not because of any, any new love of the United States or any change in their, in their view that their way of doing life, their, you know, the, the, the Islamic Sharia in the way that they interpret it, which is not how most Muslims in the world interpret it. Um, most Muslims in the West or in India interpret, uh, you know, Sharia law. They, they, they don't meet, see that it means that women have to, you know, always be accompanied by a male relative. There was an appalling story yesterday about 
woman judge who rather bravely went to her court in eastern Afghanistan and the Taliban insisted that she had a male, um, a male relative to accompany her. So she found a four-year-old boy who was a nephew um, and insisted that he came, which was a bemused boy. Um, I mean, just humiliating and an absurd way to try and you know, run a country. And, and so I think the way that the strictures that the Taliban are putting on on individuals in, in, in their own country, you know, they'll want to keep in their own country. They, they'll, they'll want not to have an internationalist agenda. But are they going to be able to stop, you know, IMU and Al Qaeda? And you mentioned, you know, uh, Lashkar Toiba and Jashi Mohammed, the you know Pakistani backed groups who are international jihadi groups because they're designed, they were founded in order to, to to carry out terrorist attacks in in India. So, you know, I think I think it's 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 going to be a really interesting challenge for the Taliban to you know for their own purposes try and stop um, international jihadism coming out of the country. On the question of the, the tension between the propaganda and the actions, the awful actions that we're seeing playing out in different parts of Afghanistan brings me to the question of recognition, which is going to be the big one for most national capitals going around. Um, there are rumors at the moment that Mullah Baradar wants foreign diplomats to attend the swearing-in ceremony. There are rumors that from Kandahar, he may return to Doha and then come back to Kabul in what will be a somewhat grand ceremony inside the presidential palace. He wants the media there. Um, the information campaign inside of Kabul is certainly being designed. I do, we're hearing rumors that Anas Haqqani has been made sort of responsible for security conditions, coordination. You know, they want some older members of the old government to attend to give them legitimacy. How does this work, David? Is One thing is to strike a deal with the Taliban. The one thing is to house them in Doha for people like Zalme Khalilzad, for Nick Carter, and for a range of other Western power brokers to withdraw and create some kind of an alternative, as awful as it might be. Um, will Britain, will the United States, with the European countries, will they recognize the Islamic Emirate? I think, um, you know, again, we, we still don't know. And I think it's going to be, if the West recognizes them, it'll be a joint decision. Um, Britain's talking about setting up a contact group with the United States and, and the European Union and, and fellow like-minded countries. Um, in order to, to discuss this, there's talk of an emergency G7 online meeting happening um, to discuss the, you know, the, the crisis in Afghanistan. So I think that the, you know, the, let, I think there's going to be a lot of, of, uh, of you know, mood taking in Western capitals. In terms of recognition it's, itself, of course, you recognize a state, you don't you know, recognize a, a, an, an administration necessarily. So I think, you know, it's, it's really a question as to, who, you know, who controls the embassies abroad. And in the late 1990s, you know, it really mattered to the Taliban that they weren't recognized by the whole of the world, except for Pakistan, UAE and Saudi Arabia. It, it, it really, I mean, I remember talking to their officials in Kabul at the time and they said, what's the problem? Why, you know, why, do, why aren't we, we recognized by uh, the United Kingdom? And, uh, you know, Ahmed Shah Massoud's brother remained the, the ambassador in London, the ambassador of the, of, the, of the former regime during the whole of their rule, and they really hated it. And that sense of you know, wanting respectability, wanting recognition conferred on them by, you know, by the international community will really matter. So all, of that, all that mood music you describe of Mullah Barada you know, being, um, uh, you know, being a, an apparently moderate leader and coming forward moderately will be something that they'll be wanting to to trade with recognition. And there are some advantages to recognition, not least that the international community could insist that here's Afghanistan, a member of the United Nations. So this is what you've signed up to, these human rights, these, um, these international treaties, you know, treaties on climate change, treaties on this, treaties on that. So you know, joining the international community um, is something that is not just a sort of um, a sweetie, it's something that you know the Taliban will then have responsibilities and um, commitments to fulfil. So I think you know that that's going to be one of the one of the rather useful levers if if there is recognition. But I think if China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan recognise the Taliban, and you know the West doesn't, um, the wider international community doesn't, most countries in the United Nations don't, then. You know, again, 
that can only strengthen um, China's influence across the world. It can only strengthen, you know, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's the sense of, of China reshaping a global geopolitics um, in its own image. That, of course, puts India in a very difficult spot um, for a whole variety of reasons. I mean, just the idea to a common citizen um, in India that the government of India would recognize the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan run by the Taliban, the arch enemies of the state since at least the late 1980s. Um, not to mention the memories of the hijacking of an Indian plane in Kandahar, not to mention the attacks led by the Haqqanis on Indian embassy personnel um, on various projects run by India, and the fact that largely large parts of the Taliban are still beholden in one way or the other to the Pakistani ISI. Um, for someone who's spent time in India and someone who kind of watches the space very carefully, um, what options does India have? Well, not many, frankly, and I think it's it's another of the it's another of the of the of the areas. You know, it, it, as part of the Quad Group, India is beginning to reshape its its foreign policy, and you know, beginning to move towards strategic alliances of the sort that you know for seventy five years it's not wanted to be involved in. Um, and I think you know the um, the very significant increasing power and presence of China across the region, you know, reduces the options for India. And I think, you know, it will come in with, with, with that Western group on, on the decision made, I, I imagine, by that, you know, Western group of nations, contact group plus, whatever it is. So I think, um, which, and that, that's, of course, a decision that's not been taken. My guess would be that there won't be recognition of the Taliban administration with the excuse that uh, Amrullah Sali remains there and that, that there is still you know, um, uh, some, some sense of questions over legitimacy and that Mullah Barada won't have his coronation with Zalmai Kalazad in the room. Um, but uh, but as, really, as I said at the beginning of this, you know, all of us who've been watching Afghanistan a lot um, have got all our yeah. predictions wrong um, in, in, in recent weeks and months. So, you know, that, that, that could well happen. And I think, um, you know, if it does happen, and, in, and the Taliban are recognised as administration and do form an inclusive administration, then, you know, then there is the opportunity for pressure and commitments and, and, uh, and, and for the Taliban to actually, you know, really do in public um, and in private um, what, uh, what they say they're doing in public. So just one more prosaic question on recognition. Uh, David, in 2001, there was the Bonn Agreement, which, of course, the Taliban was very upset with because they were kept out of it. In hindsight, it was easy for people to say they should have been involved. But frankly, at the time, it would have been impossible. Um, do you foresee something like a Bonn 2.0? I mean, at, at some point outside of Afghanistan, the Taliban is going to have to meet people like Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, Karzai various administrators, many of them who fled to Pakistan in the last flight without telling most of their bureaucracies. They're going to have to sit in some safe place where they feel comfortable in trying to figure out what this transition actually means. International communities are going to have to be involved in that process. Is there any discussion in Europe or London at this particular point in time of anything like an international conference? Uh, not, not at this stage, but again, things are moving so quickly. And I think uh, one of the key things that will be on the table at an international conference will be uh, development funding, uh, because a number of countries, the United Kingdom has a huge aid budget to Afghanistan. It was cut very significantly last year, but the government is now saying it'll increase it by 10%. That will be you know, principally humanitarian aid. There's a huge humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, even before the Taliban came into power because of the drought because of um, you know, problems with administration, you know, 10, 15 million people needing food aid uh, at the moment. So funding that is gonna be something that the international community probably will look at fondly, look at kindly. But the other interesting question, given that Afghanistan has been such a huge aid recipient um, up to now, is where the development money will go. You know, will we still want to put money into in to infrastructure? A lot of infrastructure has been damaged by the bombing in, the, in, in recent weeks. So yes, probably, um, you know, who does that money go to? How do we do it? How do we funnel the money in a way that we know that it's going, it's going where it should do in order to assist the Afghan people and not uh, lining the pockets of, of a regime that the international community are really pretty opposed to. 
And of course, you know, the other question we haven't talked about is what happens to Afghan armed forces. Um, you know, the Ameri United States was funding Afghan armed forces to the tune of some three billion dollars a year up until now. Well, clearly they're not going to carry on paying that money for for the Taliban army. Will those will those soldiers join join the Taliban? Some of them you will just melt away. They've gone home. They weren't there in the first place. It turns out. Uh, you know, they were just, it was just an army on paper. It didn't really exist in the scale of the, that the West, the American in particular, thought that it existed. But there are, there are questions over, you know, the kind of armed forces that uh, Afghanistan is going to have. You know, will the Taliban be able to operate that sophisticated American weaponry that they've taken over? Um, so I think the, the international community's relationship is more than just about recognition. It's about aid. It's about... Um, um, you know, scholarships for students, soft power, relationships with the Taliban, how, you know, how this country really operates in the world um, uh, in order to do something for the benefit of, of those Afghans, an extraordinary generation of people who, you know, benefited from um, a window, actually, of, that uh, opened and shut and, and lasted for just 20 years. I want to end with one point on emotion and politics. You've covered presidencies over close to four decades. Um, the tragedy in Afghanistan is all too clear. We all have friends um, trying to get out of the country, trying to get visas, trying to get airplanes. We've all been exposed to this horrific pictures of Afghans just trying to make it out um, or trying to get some guarantees with authorities who they have dealt with over the last 20 years. Hopes have been dashed. Um, there are lots of these stories in the media. I want to come down to Biden for a minute is the debate in the United States is a bit camouflaged in a sense. It's often about a binary. Um, the Biden administration and others seem to be making this point that we should be getting out. There's another side which said we should be staying in for some time. But I think that's almost irrelevant. It's very clear that this is not about staying in or going out. It's about the end of the war in Afghanistan. It's how you did it. Now, Clearly, the administration seems to be swimming back. There are a lot more administration faces taking interviews. Uh, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, was in the press box in the White House earlier today or maybe yesterday. Um, but the fact is, the criticism is it seems very clear that this presidency has lost that emotional moment, which matters in politics. It's not just about the numbers. It's just not about the trillions of dollars. It's not about the material investments and outcomes. But there is an emotion, for instance, of the moment, which cannot be caught, it cannot be presupposed, which changes the way in which leaders and global leaders react. How do you read this moment in American politics and with this presidency? It's really disastrous for Joe Biden. Um, you mentioned my book, which is, which is coming out next month, The Long War. And I, I, I very much hope that to be able to come to India and perhaps do some book talks, um, uh, if, uh, you know, COVID permitting, um, I, I, mean, I was planning to go to Kabul next month, but I think I might put that on hold. Um, but Biden, it's fascinating. When, when, when I did the research for that book, the year 2009 is the crucial year in Afghanistan when the, the Obama administration came in and decided whether they were going to put more troops in or whether they were going to withdraw. And Biden was the strongest voice in the White House throughout 2009 through those long discussions. It took the whole year to decide the decision was finally made in December of 2009 to, to commit troops to the surge. And Stan McChrystal was then the commanding officer there. And Biden, throughout those talks, I talked to a number of people in the White House um, uh, uh, who were there at the time. And they said there was always that moment at the end of the meeting when Joe Biden would, you know, people would say we want 10,000, 20,000, 40,000 more troops, when he'd say we've got to bring it down to 1,000. And he was the... He was the elder statesman. He was the, you know, he'd been the, the foreign policy guru. Um, all the people there were far younger than him um, back in, in the White House in, in, in 2009. So he was respected and listened to, but, they, but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't listened to in the sense that they didn't do what he wanted. But he and uh, Jake Sullivan was also there with him and, and Tony Blinken, the, now the Secretary of State, um, were very strong back then that they didn't want to be boxed in was the phrase they used by the generals. They always felt that the generals were wanting to put more troops in, wanting to keep the war going for longer. And I think that background really informed uh, the decisions that he's made this year. Those same figures alongside him 
um, when he's made these decisions to pull out troops, whatever happened, and to pull them out more quickly than many in the international community who had troops there alongside the United States wanted to happen. So I think it's, it's in that background. And you have to look at what was really a disastrous speech actually yesterday for, for Joe Biden. You have to look at that speech in the context of um, the individual that we know that he is and the sense that he doesn't want, you know, he never wanted this time generals to be boxed in. There was a, an influential report in January, soon after he came to, uh, to office in, in January of this year uh, by uh, Joe Dunford, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, former uh, uh, general who commanded in Afghanistan, making the case for keeping troops there really for the medium term. I mean, America first entered the Second World War in 1941. They still have troops in Germany. And that sense of you know, American commitment to countries being for the long term is something that Biden, particularly in this case, particularly because of the flawed nature of this war and the way that the war has been looked back on. He wanted to finish the war. And I think it's, it's damaged his foreign policy credentials, certainly inside the United States, uh, and it's damaged America's standing internationally. And I think but that's, that that's the thing that was behind it. He wasn't going to change his mind. And you talk about the emotional moments in politics. That was the thing, the driving force that inspired him was not wanting to be boxed in by the generals once again to keep troops there for, for the long term. If not now, when, he said. Um, and he's taken that decision and it's his responsibility. And that's just, I mean, it's a responsibility that will be difficult to live with, I can only imagine. Um, no one questions the merits of withdrawal. I think anyone understands that for a country like the United States, after 20 years of being engaged for Britain and for Denmark and Norway and many other countries, the forever wars can't continue. Um, but the cost of the manner and method in which this withdrawal was done um, in, act in lives, in the thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives, um, I wonder if this administration will reflect on these. I also wonder if they will be able to take a step back in the, in the short term and be able to play a more proactive role rather than just wash their hands off through some kind of international process, try and exert as much as leverage as is possible with the only hope for the Afghan people that the Taliban practice the propaganda on the ground and not just on camera. With that, David Loin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your precious time, your understanding. And we should have you back soon, not only on a webinar, but also in India to discuss The Long War, your new book. Thank you very much. Thank, well, thank you for the questions from the floor, and I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you, Rudy. Really.